This is the OGM Weekly Call for Thursday, August 22nd, 2024. Um, I proposed a topic last night, late, uh, of long-termism, and more broadly, uh, long-term thinking. Like, I think we all think, I think we all think it'd be interesting to hear any objections that considering the long-term is a wise thing to do. <clears throat> and um, there seems to be enormous backlash against that or against some segment of it. And uh, I'm trying to figure out why, what's happening? Uh, how does this work? Uh, am I off in my observation? Uh, however, however that works. Hey, Stacy, Jose, John, Carl. <clears throat> uh, Can nice you say what the backlash was? Yeah, so uh, Sam Bankman Freed, the guy who did FTX, uh, the exchange basically uh, had a mo monster Ponzi scheme going. He was also um, a very quickly self-made billionaire because of the Ponzi scheme. And he was one of the major proponents of effective altruism, which is a whole way of thinking that says, hey, let's do the most efficient thing with our money uh, possible to make the world better. And some effective altruists, and I may be way over generalizing here, some effective altruists were like, well, the thing, the right thing to do for, for the long term is to make as money as you possibly can right now so that you have a lot of money to do something with the, when you're, while you're still young and can do it. Um, which then took away the responsibility for what was going on in making all that money, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I think that's one of the critiques. And I don't really fully know the rest of the critiques because effective altruism, when it first showed up on the scene, seemed to me like, well, good, let's get let's fix philanthropy, which has been broken for a long time. Um, there's this really interesting uh, New York Times op-ed that Peter Buffett wrote that I've mentioned once or twice on the call here, Peter Buffett is the son of Warren Buffett, the very famous investor. And uh, Peter wrote about the philanthropic industrial complex. And he said, uh, when I was young, my dad didn't give us that much money, but then he suddenly gave each of us a considerable amount more. And I started getting invited to meetings I wasn't invited to before. And I started to see a really weird dynamic in these meetings, which was that very often the left hand was trying to fix something the right hand had broken. And he said, the problem here is that there, there was a whole industry, and he called it the philanthropic industrial complex. There's a whole industry here of people who are pretty well off and running around on the philanthropic circuit as a lifestyle business, not necessarily always fixing stuff or making things better. There's a bunch of other dynamics around that as well. But, but so, so I give that as background because when effective altruism showed up, um, it seemed like, well, good, somebody's going to think differently about philanthropy and giving and whatever else. One of my background beliefs, just to put this on the table, is that the reason the U.S. has such a large nonprofit uh, sector is that the for-profit sector is busy causing so many problems, that if we had some more humane form of capitalism or something to replace it, there would be much less need for all these nonprofits to do their rescue work uh, and help work that, that normal that the normal doing of life and business would take care of a lot of those problems but it does not it actually causes a whole bunch of them um so uh does that does that make enough sense to see and, and I, i'm not clear why effective altruism seems to have taken long-termism down with it but there's a bunch of articles you can find i i, I I'll, I'll share a couple in the chat that are absolute takedowns of long-termism which seems to be connected entirely to long-term thinking. And I'm not sure about that. So I could be off in my perception, but my, my worry here is that somehow unexpectedly and quite vociferously, a bunch of people have, <clears throat> have managed to put a dent in a lot of good people's work to think ahead and to actually plan well for our common future. Uh, which might cause us to behave very differently today. Um, so with that as the intro, intro um, hi, Judy. Nice to see you. Uh, with that as the intro, I'm wondering what anybody else has perceived about this and um, how you see it. I mean, just one about the intro. It just it seems weird to me that we split kind of societal well-being into philanthropy and not philanthropy. Um, so It is weird. 
it's kind of, but I mean, you don't have to. We we could we could just talk about societal well being, and it's kind of like dividing businesses into nonprofit and for profit. It's like that's an arbitrary tax identification. That's not, you know, we we don't need to use it. Yep. Anyone else? I'm posting a couple of the articles I just mentioned in the chat. And I think there's also um, many dysfunctional variants of how we should behave in the long run, which some of these articles are pointing to. It's like, oh, don't worry, the robots are going to fix everything. John. Well, I just, I just think a conversation about philanthropy and nonprofits and capitalism and for-profits needs to also include governance. And, and I've always wondered, you know, like, if anyway, the relationship is, it's, it always has struck me is that nonprofits were just a short circuit way to have your taxes go to a particular thing instead of just going into the, into the pool of tax taxes for other people to decide what gets, what gets bought, you know? And so I think I don't have anything real profound to say other than I think, I think the governmental role and governance has to be has to be part of that mosaic if you're going to look at rights and wrongs and functions and dysfunctions. Um, thanks, John. Um, and there's an interesting conversation here about how we govern and how we share resources and what the role of taxes and other stuff is. Um, I was calling it the philanthropic industrial complex. The actual title is the charitable industrial complex of Peter Buffett's uh, article. And that's a gift link in the chat right now for that article. Um, other thoughts, other perspectives, John. Yes. So, um, just backing it up, you know, to some history, uh, going back as far as art of the long view, Peter Schwartz. I mean, the, the reason why people started doing this, uh, well, of course was they thought that these long-term effects were large, dangerous, but also potentially profitable. And they were they were attempting to weaken the obsession with the short term. Uh, there's a you know, it's very clear that what forces are in play that would want to get us to be obsessed about the short term, quarterly profits, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But also, you know, what's what's right in front of us has a certain uh, amygdala grabbing effect. So, all right, let's think long term. And then the attack on the long term, uh, well, it can take many forms. Obviously, uh, I mean, I haven't read the articles. I can I can imagine several ways in which you could attack long term thinking. But similarly, there's a if if you uh, like like right now, there's a, there was a recent New York Times series uh, with graphics and good graphics and good charts, and it basically said there are like six. Uh, tipping points. Did you, you all see this? Um, it, it was it was scary, <laughs> you know. And it didn't it didn't it wasn't clearly short term or long term. It said they said you know when when do we lose the Atlantic current? Well, could be as early as twenty fifty seven. Uh, that's kind of long term, or it could be twenty one hundred. But the consequences are enormous. You know, the consequences are hard to imagine. Uh, without millions of people dying uh so um there's different there's these different forces there's the forces that want to say hey wait a minute wait a minute uh, there's five really important things that are not being getting enough, enough attention let's make them more urgent as a way to get the attention so there's people using short-termism kind of as a technique to raise the attention on what they see as a bigger problem that's just observations about the different forces in play. Yeah, thanks, John. If you remember the more about the name of the article, um, I'd love to sort of uh, find which one because I've collected a whole mess of articles about. Oh my God, you know the, the catastrophe is imminent, but I don't know which yeah. one you mean. Well, I'll get, I'll find it, and I'll send you the link. Sweet. Um, there's also yeah. an, another ism. There's a bunch of isms here. There's another ism called accelerationism. Uh, which basically yep. says, hey, if we accelerate the catastrophe, maybe more people will pay attention to the catastrophe and maybe we can get through it faster or figure out what the next regime is. Uh, not entirely an enlightened uh, look forward, I think. 
Um, Carl, I think you might have had your hand yeah. up before, yeah. Mike. Go ahead, Just John. Quick, quick, quick question. You would distinguish, I'm quite sure, the accelerationism you just referred to from the AI accelerationist movement, uh, which, is which, which is a branch of it. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, and, the AI well, acceleration is, is, is positive. The, 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 the negative one says, let's speed this up so that we can deal with it. Right. Uh, the, the, uh, the more uh, blissfully optimistic one says, uh, AI will eventually solve these problems. Uh, if we speed up AI, you know, then... Then this, we'll, uh, it's actually that'll, called that'll solve the problem. There's actually a, it's called EAC or effective accelerationism. Yeah, okay. um, yeah. yeah it has a it has a yeah. its own little name at this point. But yes, that uh, I agree with. Um, that's an yes, important yes. Andreessen and those guys. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Um, right. Carl, I think you might have had your hand up before Mike, but I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, actually, I did. Go for, uh, go for it, Carl. Then Mike. Then everybody else. We got a lot of hands. Yeah. Okay, yeah. It's um. Well, I posted the link. There's a project that's been around for 28 years. It started as part of the UN. Um, they came up with uh, 15 global challenges, but then they kind of split off from the UN when the UN went with the development goals strategy and stuff. But they get into Delphi and like state of the future index and things. So I, I put those links in. Mm -hmm. um, and stuff that <laughs> well you were just talking about that, re <laughs> that reminds me of uh, the money python go charging in and then it's like run away it's like <laughs> i mean that with we have a huge lack of systems uh systems thinking is part of it and then um yeah and then there's so that's um one of the projects i've been working on a um, with that with the international society for the system sciences and things so that's been a big part of um of what i'm what i've been looking at um we had a person come in and talk with the um with the um with efficient altruism is that or yeah yeah that um effective the, the, the example they used was um, that, like getting um, m um, nets to address uh, malaria and stuff. Um, and I brought up, well, okay, we save a lot of lives, but then, you know, that that's going to exacerbate other things. Like, are they going to start to death, or you know, things? And then, um, and they brought up. They brought up um, the one they decided they were going to uh, attack was the um, Make a Wish uh, Make a Wish Foundation, which hmm. I also thought was kind of strange because I mean you got um, I guess that that's one, well, yeah. So anyway, I'll I'll stop there. But yeah, it was just kind of interesting that that's the one they decided to bash. Yeah, thanks, Carl. You're reminding me of a book. I'm trying to figure out what book it was. Uh, that talked about how in Europe and then the Americas, a series of revolutions happened in kind of what I'll call in retrospect, the right order. So there was the agricultural revolution, the hygiene revolution, a bunch of other things, because when you have better hygiene, people can live longer because a lot of your diseases are basically bad water and, and you know, transmitted diseases uh, and medical revolutions and so forth. And then how in other countries, the revolutions happened in the wrong order. So India under the Raj uh, goes through this the wrong way because the British kind of take over India and then screw that up and don't understand the, the implications of, of all that. And I'm, I'm, I wish I remember the, the name of the book because I, I will, I'm paraphrasing it poorly, but it was really intriguing because I don't know how much control we have over these things, although we do have control over when and whether we budget for a healthcare system or a, or, or a sewage system or a clean water system. Those are clearly major infrastructural projects that happen. Um, but it seems like if they happen in the wrong order, a lot of people starve um, or, or, other, or other kinds of bad consequences can happen. Um, Mike. Thanks for proposing this topic. Um, it's one that is in front of my mind and has been for about 35 years. When I first got in politics in the 80s, 
there was a pretty interesting cadre of congressmen and a few senators who were very focused on 40, you know, 30, 40, 50 year projections. And it wasn't just the Atari Democrats like Al Gore and John Kerry, it was also Newt Gingrich. And they 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 formed something called the Congressional Clearinghouse on the Future and would bring in people like uh, Toffler, um, some of, I think Peter Schwartz probably spoke to them. And this was the mid eighties, but no one does that anymore. I mean, it, it's just considered a waste of time to try to figure out where we'll be in 20, 30, 40 years. Now, this is personal to me. I'm on the board of the Arthur C. Clarke Foundation, which has been around for 37 years. Our goal is to get more people to think like Arthur C. Clarke and to do future thinking, to think about the implications of some of our new technologies and to not just think about the economics and the technology, but also the societal consequences, the psychological impacts. But it's hard for us to get any funding to, to do the events we do. We're gearing up to do our annual gala dinner at the French embassy here in Washington, the middle of November. And we're honoring Nicholas Negroponte. We're honoring the Webb Space Telescope and we're honoring the Monterey Aquarium and three institutions and, and people who try to get us looking at, at a bigger picture. But it's, it's, it's not something people have time for anymore. And we don't see a lot of futurist books anymore. Um, maybe the science fiction writers are doing some utopia development, but in terms of the rigorous kind of analysis like Peter Schwartz is famous for doing, I, I, I'm not seeing as much. Maybe I'm looking in the wrong places. Uh, maybe the things that were done 20, 30, 40 years ago proved to be ineffective. So that's why we're not getting support for it. I, I, I just, I think we're missing something really important. We're particularly missing the opportunity to teach 12 and 15 year olds about how they can understand the future that they're going to grow up into. Mm -hmm. So just an expression of frustration yeah. and a request for help. If, if anybody does have um, a sense of how we can reinvigorate futurology. Um, thanks, Mike. It, it's weird because like the, a lot of companies used to have strategic planning departments in the eighties, <clears throat> those melted and went away and got destroyed. And so it was kind of every department or every line of business to themselves. Um, I'm not sure. Peter Schwartz has long now, um, long view. I don't know how much deep, I, I think there was some research there, but the, the strategic planning, the scenario planning thing they propose of two axes and all that is really quite simple. It's, it's, not, it's not grounded. It's not like the world game where Bucky Fuller and everybody tried to take actual data and sort of try to map stuff as best they could, which, you know, at the time wasn't that well. Um, a friend of mine was at both of the World Games, the original one with Bucky Fuller, and then they they re sort of reconstituted it later with more modern computers and was apparently quite interesting. But that was an attempt to play out uh, scenarios in different ways, not so much scenarios as as uh, like the dynamics of the globe. And then um, I'm trying to remember now, some famous hedge fund manager from Blackstone or somewhere uh, spent a whole lot of research money trying to figure out global trends and global cycles and all of that and put a bunch of very, you know, too smart and highly paid researchers to do that. I don't know what came of it. And, and uh, but, but it was an attempt to do exactly this kind of thing, maybe only in a private setting, which doesn't really necessarily help anybody else, but as an investment strategy research method. Um, Doug. I think it's worth distinguishing between long-term thinking and thinking about the long-term. Uh, Long-term thinking, a good example would be, I think, the, the Catholic Church, uh, which actually did a remarkable job in a number of ways. And thinking about the long-term would be uh, Joseph Tainter's uh, The Collapse of Complex Societies. Uh, and those are different agendas. 
Can you say more about that? Wow. <laughs> I mean, that was a whole bunch of it, just a couple sentences. So uh, can you uh, unpack it a little bit? Well, the Catholic Church uh, has lasted for a long time and has been a very effective organizing uh, structure. Uh, maybe not to our liking, but it is, certainly you can't miss the fact that it had a huge impact uh, on culture and society and that it, uh, its thinking was long term. Uh, was it thinking? Was it thinking actually long term? Because the way the, the the way Catholics went around the world, they weren't behaving in any long term way. Like like like, uh, if you didn't want to be a, a colonial subject of the Portuguese or the Spanish, pretty much almost the most Catholic of the colonizers, because they didn't give a damn about the, whether the people survived. They just wanted gold and silver and jewels. That's it. I'm I'm generalizing probably a little too much. But, but, you know, British colonizers and others at least wanted you to be a, a raw material source for the longer run. So they cared about the, the, the fact that you stayed alive. <clears throat> I, I'm, being, I'm being a little harsh, but, but I, I'm unclear that the Roman Catholic Church, other than having a vision of an afterlife in heaven and all that, is, was actually planning for the long run. They happen to have been very durable and to have had a huge effect on the planet. I'll, I'll grant you that. Well, I take, for example, the movement to build cathedrals in the 11th, 12th, 13th century. That's marketing. Uh, That's like we have the most powerful come building on, in town. Come on. Look at us. It, it, it's culture and it's extraordinary. It stimulated the Renaissance and many other things. And it's just long term thinking. You don't build a cathedral for t next week. Uh, so I don't want to defend that idea anymore. If it doesn't take, it doesn't take. Um, the I, uh, the yeah, other yeah. idea with mm -hmm. Joseph Tainer is thinking about the long term, uh, not long term thinking. Uh, and what Tainer wants is us to be aware that economic activity uh, creates complexity, which creates the conditions for social failure. So I'm just giving these as two different ways of looking at long term thinking. Thank you. Um, and the collapse of, collapse of complex societies, um, which I should have read but haven't read, I think it's in a stack of books I've got, um, is uh, interesting that way. Um, and studies a whole bunch of failed societies and the causes of societal collapse. Um, cool. Sorry, we had a, a lot of people still in, in the queue. Uh, David. Dave. Yeah, thanks. I mean, and I, I like your point, Doug, and I was thinking about the, you know, like the Gaudi Cathedral and if you're going to plan, you know, plan a building that's going to take 100 years to build, you've got, you know, you, you've got more than the seven, the, the next quarter kind of in mind. Uh, and, I, and I think that's really, and, I, and Buddhism has been another example I've gone back to. It's like, you know, something that's like, at least over the course of a couple thousand years has, you know, had an intent to change society. You know, it's like there's a structure for it and it replicates and, you know, there's a, there's a, a learning component that's built into the entity um, that I think is fascinating. Uh, and I just wanted to give, you know, in the framing thing, Jerry, the reason I ended up saying, oh, I'll go to this, this is an interesting topic is because I translated the long-term thinking to this notion of transformation that, you know, I feel like a lot of us are working for on social transformation. And, and I think social transformation implies kind of like a paradigm shift from wherever we are today. But then I start, if you think about it very deeply, it gets kind of confusing because you're still going to start, you have to kind of start from where you are today and you have to take an incremental step. How do you take an incremental step that's not on the same paradigm, you know? And so you end up with a curve of some sort, it feels like there's a Zeno's paradox kind of thing going on here, you know? And so you're, you're starting from where you are today, no matter what your goal is, you know? And so you claim you want to be at a different place plane but getting to that different plane how what does that mean kind of and and how would you think about that as somebody who wants to do social change um and so i've ended up with a few kind of images that i think i, I like one is this idea that that you you see this social change from the perspective you're coming at it from you know so mike sees it from you know from the asimovian perspective you know i kind of see a lot of it from the the we created the internet we could do cool things like that again you know so there's perspective there's a lens and so the, the line that I got was like, there's many, many paths to the top of the mountain. 
And, and I think that's probably true. You know, there's, there's a lot of different perspectives that kind of move you up to the top of the mountain. And then one of the problems is, are you on the right mountain? Um, and I don't know how you answer that one. Um, thanks, Dave. On the topic of how do you make a small change go on a new path, um, one of my mentors in grad school was Russell Acuff, one of the founders of Systems Thinking. And he had a process called Idealized Redesign, where he would run people through an exercise to rethink their company uh, by helping them imagine that their whole company was destroyed, uh, that there were no records, there was no database, there was no, there, you know, the, the remnants of their old business were gone. Just the people who constituted the business showed up on Monday and were like, oh my gosh, now what do we want to do? And it gave them a chance to really rethink um, their, their, their capacities, what was happening in the world and come up with an ide idealized future. And then, and which is not the same as long-termism. It, it was long, it, it was medium-term thinking from my own present perspective. So I'm not using it as an example of long-termism, but then when they came back and sort of back cast into the present for what to do now, if they had two equivalent candidates for a job position, they would they would then know to choose the candidate who better fit their idealized plan, the, the, the thing they were now shooting for. And so it did inform, as far as I can tell, every small action they took because now they had a shared vision, a better shared vision, which was still plastic. They could they could mutate it a bit of where, where they were aiming uh, that was different from where they currently were. Um, so I, th I found it like hugely useful and, and, and a nice exercise for how to make people uh, let go a bit of the present and uh, step into some alternate future and then make it come about. Um, Judy, uh, you're muted. I routinely do that because there's background noise. Um, I think that we've got a couple of really big issues that I'm not sure we can do anything about, but I just want to surface them. One is that we have an array of people and organizations doing some level of thinking about what the future might be, envisioning alternatives, but we have no one that really systematically develops a map to change that if it needs to occur, to identify critical areas. I mean, you might think population was an area, you might think pollution is an area, all of those subsets. But moreover, we don't have any way to, to, to really inform the larger body of people and engage any action on those things. So there's an execution problem. Even if you have a good plan and you've identified the issues, you don't have a way to effectively execute to try to address those issues. And I think that that comes back to a systematic problem in our educational system in terms of teaching the young people of the world, the leaders of the future that are gonna be there doing things in 30 years, how to examine in a different way and how to inform themselves to take action. And underneath all of that, there's a huge level of people who are just not functioning at a very good level at all. And these issues just get so overwhelming that I get tired thinking about them. <laughs> they do, they do. And there's a big tangle of uh, big tangle, tangle of spaghetti on the table already and we're half an hour into this conversation. So I, I don't know, it would be interesting to maybe think about tackling some of those in segments so that as a collective group we could think about okay let's do this week on this tier and next week on that tier or every other week or something that might be a way to focus it i'm i'm concerned in almost every situation that i'm in that people are not engaging and they don't even engage intellectually to actually think about what's being discussed let alone contemplate doing something that might affect their personal behavior or the favor, the interactions that they have with other people and trying to influence them. So there's just an incredible um, stagnation, I guess is as good a word as any, but it's very frustrating. <laughs> it is. Um, Judy, what you just said made me realize that a piece of this, what about long-termism and backlash against long-term thinking that I'm perceiving is right parallel to backlash against wokeism, woke, and all of those kinds of things. And I'm, I'm wondering who's backing the lash, like, like who's on the other side and, and arguing uh, against these sorts of things. And I'm very interested in Aikido strategies that flip the dynamics. I'm seeing the Democratic National Convention where I, April and I were like, nah, we're not gonna watch. And then we get hooked early and then we are just bawling in front of the TV night after night because it's been stellar 
and they are taking back the word freedom. They are punching the bully in the nose. They are doing a whole mess of things I wish they had done for a decade. Um, and it's really interesting. And there may, be, there may be some other things that come out of it that I don't like, but at this moment, they're just knocking it out of the park as far as I can tell. And, I, and part of why I'm motivated with the, about this topic of long-termism is, is there a way to help people um, care about helping to plan a common future again? Judy, like you just said, people are disaffected. They're not engaging. Uh, the people in the hall there are pretty engaged and they're trying to motivate everybody to come out and vote for better or worse, whether our democracy works, et cetera, et cetera, is a whole other set of issues. But but I'm really interested in things that help people make a difference and get reconnected to one another, because I think that's one of our solutions long run for rebuilding our society. Go ahead, Judy. There's, there's one other dimension of it, and that is uh, my sense is that massively across all societies, individuals have lost a feeling of potency. They feel powerless and caught up in something that's so beyond them that they don't even contemplate what their personal reaction could be that would make their own situation less difficult than it is. And that's something that's a cultural norm that has evaporated as we've become a more affluent society, at least amongst the affluent. And the people who never felt empowered still feel unempowered and see no possibility of getting out of that quagmire. So there's a there's a passive fatalism that is really disturbing to me to, to observe. And that's not my nature. It's not how I was brought up. My mom always said, well, what are you going to do about that? That was almost the first, you know, first she'd say, what do you think? And then she'd say, what do you want to do about it? <laughs> and that was from three on. So that's my thought process. It's, it's intrinsic, but that's not the thought process of the masses of people that I meet. And that that structures society in a very unconstructive way. So mm -hmm. I don't mean to sound so fatalist. I know that sounds really fatalist, but I think unless we can figure out some corners of activity to address it, it is fatalist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I'm going to double down on your fatalism for just a second. Um, uh, mo many of you, most of you know that the word consumer like caused me to think about a lot of new stuff back in the 90s, mid 90s, I realized I didn't like the word consumer. So a thought in my brain is that consumer is consumerization of our world took away our sense of agency. Because your only job as a consumer is to buy more crap, whether you need it or not, because otherwise the economy will grind to a halt and there will be great calamity. Um, and you're not supposed to share that thing because that means fewer people buy that thing. So the sharing economy was like, no, 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 we're going to need fewer cars, et cetera. But consumerization eats our brains by, by removing our sense of, I have agency to do stuff. And we consumerized elections, education, healthcare, everything. Like, like, we've, like we don't realize it, but, but it, it's like ice nine. It basically, everything it touched, it converted. And when we're treated as mere consumers, um, really bad things happen out the other end. And right now we're suffering from that. And this is merely my own diagnosis of the situation. Uh, but that that's kind of my worldview is that that consumerization was a major contributor to the woes we're trying to figure our way through right now. Can I add one other thing and then I'll, I'll quit? <clears throat> I'll come coming back to my statistic that I've been frustrated with that the reading competency level of this country, which is a developed country, is fourth grade. <clears throat> which means you really can't even read the newspaper because it's written more like seventh or eighth grade. And so people aren't reading. They're only getting sound bites from whatever they're listening to on TV. It's filtered in very little content and so forth. And so we have masses of uninformed people and we have children that are not being invited to be educated or to become knowledgeable about anything. And I, I'm back to the fatalism, but I mean, unless we can figure out how to start some inroads and set some models and then find some agency to replicate those models, I just have trouble seeing how we're going to climb out of this hole. Totally agree. Um, thanks, Judy. Um, oops. Got my window quiet. Uh, no, <laughs> don't, Judy, that was really terrific. Don't, no need to be quiet. Uh, thank you for jumping in. Uh, Carl. And thanks, uh, thanks, somebody, thanks for being patient, uh, Carl. I was digressing a lot uh, in there. Go, so go ahead. Uh, yeah, it's um, so such a rich conversation and things. Um, one of the you um, mentioning Toffler earlier that in particular the, the book The Third Wave and stuff. It's kind of as it kind of ties the 
the epochal changes to communications technology. So it's like we over 4,000 years, we went from hunter gatherers to farmers. And then in four centuries, we went from farmers to industrial workers. And now we're at 40 years. Mm -hmm. In fact, that's kind of the premise I came up with is that Engelbart <laughs> was 40 years ahead of his time. He left left over this information. The third wave is um, the topplers um, frame it. So, I mean, think of the, uh, so, I mean, we've, even just the computer, I mean, with the mainframe and time sharing, and you, you bring you bring your request, and it's like we'll get back to you whenever. To the point where we got the PC, where everybody was running out there and building their own DBase three systems, and then John would go on vacation for two weeks, and the whole office shut down, um, type of stuff. And now we got these phones and AI. So I mean, we're the just the um, we cross the threshold uh, where the technology is speed accelerating the um, pace of societal change and the biological generation is not the most dynamic force anymore. So the whole idea of generations is getting less. It, while there might have been some historical reference, um, it's, it's, getting the, it's getting less and less relevant. I think it really is tied more to the cot like um the the we're cohorts through time there are people who were in like the, they say we're mostly in our in the um alpha brain state for like the first seven years of our life so it's i i think there's kind of like this um we're cohorts through time like overlapping cohorts through time and it makes much like somebody who's five years older than um than one of my nephews is there's a much bigger difference than there was between people who are five years older or younger than me and stuff. I mean, that's kind of stuff, but yeah, I got, I've been thinking about this stuff um, quite a bit too. So, um, and I posted some links to um, that millennium project. I mean, they, they identified 15 global problems. So for 28 years, I mean, if you talk to anybody who's involved with that, all you have to do is say challenge 11 and that's about status of women and, and stuff. So they, they, there's a network of think tanks all around the world and stuff. So I've always been interested in that. I wasn't sure if Mike had any connections with um, Jerome Glenn is the, executive director and he's here in dc as well as uh, that john peterson um with the arlington institute i read oh, a oh, book I of his it. like from the 80s on i haven't the talked with him in ages well he's he's a little bit over the he's a different person now let's really um, okay yeah, i i never i read them it's the like oh they're here i should <laughs> never john, john peterson is telling strange tales of i mean it's it's conspiracy theories and all the rest. Uh, yeah, that's like that. I couldn't believe that Robert David Steele. I had actually met him on, on some of the open source intelligence was his big book. He had 40. He was the um, most book reviews in 40 categories on Amazon. <clears throat> Yet he got into this whole conspiracy theory stuff, all this. Um, stuff of like COVID was a hoax, but he died of COVID um, and stuff. It was just like, like what happened to this guy? He was probably one of the most intellectual people um, back in the early 2000s. I, I don't think he was intellectual, but he was provocative and that was helpful. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I, yeah, I, I did meet him at an open source conference and yeah, it's definitely was, <laughs> had the, Broad, like the broad view and was making all kinds of connections to things. And so that was what I had found impressive. But yeah, I was shocked when I when I saw the what he well how he how his life ended there. But I'll stop there. Thanks, Carl. Um, which corner of all the stuff we put on the table is most interesting to you, or would you like to add any other angles to this? Uh, if I could pick up a real quick thought, please. Um, I mentioned earlier how we don't have a lot of credible futurists 
in the in the business anymore. And part of it is because some of the people who told good stories in the 90s just kept getting more and more extreme or more and more out of the box until nothing that they were predicting was actually going to happen. And so we've we've seen a discrediting of the 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 job title of futurist by some of these people. And I, I, I don't know how we change that, but maybe that's one place to ask, one place to look is if if we want to have rigorous forecasts or at least rigorous scenarios that we can prepare ourselves for, how do we how do we change that? How do we get away from the um, almost science fiction or science farce uh, material that's being written and, and get to something where we're um, doing strategic planning that CEOs and uh, C-suite executives and um, cabinet secretaries can make use of. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Judy. I was just wondering if some sort of simple segmentation of the process, which is so cumbersome, might be useful for our discussion and have a separate session on sort of analysis or foresight as a beginning point, and then what about it, and then how to do or engage, and actually dig into depth into those segmentation areas, because I think this group is so used to the whole continuum we focus at the big picture. As the, as the larger topic of discussion, which I think is very, very rich, but it doesn't actually get us to the implementation stage with the engagement and education of people, or in particular, addressing the youth, because the children are the ones that really are gonna to have to deal with this in 30 years. And we don't wanna burden them with it's a catastrophic mode of thinking, but we want to involve them in identifying, thinking about and solving and taking action on what's within their span of control at the age of eight or 10 or whatever it might be. And so there's a, a learning process here that would be doing a great favor for the universe if we could get it executed in a broader scale. Um, so Judy, I'm hearing you say you're interested in a, a sequence of calls on this topic that split the problem up. Um, I had a late inspiration for this topic and just threw it in. It, it, um, it, we're having a, a lovely conversation, but I don't know if yeah. others would yeah. like to do that as well. I'm I'm up for it. Uh, John, I think we're getting some ambient noise from your phone. Um, and uh, so I'd love to hear from others if you'd like to sort of divvy this up. I can also see that even just going into the foresight problem, like if we, if we started with uh, your proposed split, there are a hundred different foresight techniques. I don't know how to rate them or whatever. Maybe there's a way to, to slide through this that's really, that gets us into some productive results quickly, but I'm open to all, all proposals on how to do this. Um, I think, I think, I just think we're, we'll have a hard time. I don't think we need to be chronicling all the foresight techniques and I don't think it's possible to compare them and, and declare winners or anything like that. That doesn't seem to be a productive way to go through it. Uh, yeah. Ken writes in the chat that Bob Johansson uh, of IFTF is a good futurist. It's interesting. I did a lot of work with IFTF a lot. And one of the problems I saw in their method was that they deciduously avoided politics and power, <laughs> assiduously. And they were mostly left-leaning people, but when it came to what got shown to clients, they were careful not to load it with you know, one side or the other. And, and I'm afraid in retrospect, I think that power dictated a lot of the changes that we're seeing right now that we're suffering under. It's power, it struggles over power. <clears throat> that then influence everything else, you know, and, and bounce it bounces around the room. So, so I'm wondering uh, what we need a futurist that doesn't ignore a third of what's force uh, the forcing function on our futures in some sense. Um, and I I think that uh, if you look at the Neo Books project or our work trying to create a you know collaborative sense making or collective intelligence, the stuff that we've been chipping away at with like <clears throat> plastic spoons for the last four years since the start of lockdown is the stuff that could contribute a lot to solving this, I think. I, th I think uh, many of us are here because we think that 
humans sharing better what they see and what they know and making more sense of it so that other people can attach to their opinion and maybe even form blocks for voting or doing or whatever else would be a good thing. Um, and Judy, we, go ahead. And then I'll well, go I was just going to reinsert. I think that humanity has lost their personal sense of agency. They just feel powerless in the quagmire that they're embroiled in. And somehow establishing that for adults and teaching it to children, if people don't feel they have any agency, there's no point in all of the thinking about it. It just is a frustrating exercise. I mean, it's edifying, but it's not helpful. And so there's an actuation uh, opportunity of some sort, but I don't know where to start or how to start. Um, it just, you know, I, in my personal events, it's sort of, it, I, I just sort of turn to the group and say, well, what do we want to do about this? And there will be a third of the people who participate in that. And then I can come back and say, well, do we have an action team that we want to put together? Do we want to label certain steps we're going to take in a time frame? But that's Judy Benham in one room of people. That's maybe 30 people. It's not millions of people. Um, and it's usually a room of people that are not too dissimilar from me in terms of educational level and capacity. So I think this is a, a huge sociological issue, but it would be, I think, very informative to identify the leverage points and, and it may be in each of those spheres and how might we better interface with those or influence those that we come in contact with. Um, thanks, Judy. And I've got I've got my own opinions about how to get people engaged again, but I've been jumping in too often. So let's go to Doug. The, um, the reason that we don't have futurists is because if we look at the generation of people like Peter Schwartz, they were riding an arrow into the future that was fairly well defined as the future of technology. We no longer have a vector towards any future. So it's very hard to get a grip on it. Uh, it's not our failure. I think it's the failure of history itself has really changed fundamentally. Thanks, Doug. Um, John? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how my comment is gonna play in the wake of Doug's comment, but um, I'll just chime in that I'm a I'm a big fan of Peter Schwartz and, the, and I know it was put in the chat over there the long view scenario planning. Um, I think it would be consistent with the philosophy of open global mind uh, to recognize that there's an infinite number of futures possible, right? And and this <laughs> idea of trying to predict the future um, is folly. Uh, no matter how uh, intelligent or informed someone thinks they are, I think. Um, and but but then the thing I was going to say that that isn't I don't think consistent with what Doug just said. If if a person or a group of people um, can identify and agree upon uh, a, a, a coherent set of driving forces, um, and then looking at at futures the way. Uh, Peter Schwartz suggested, which is cast out an array of possible futures and, and almost set them up as archetypes. If you're not saying, the, the, let me interrupt myself and say the problem I always see when I try to introduce scenario planning and people try to apply the idea is so quickly it turns into alternatives analysis. And, and like, I don't know what it is about like our contemporary human psyche, but but people want to say, well, there's this future and there's that future. And, you know, like watch the Republican and Democratic conventions, you know, they're talking about, well, if the, if you vote wrong, this is going to happen. Or if you vote wrong, that's going to happen. Where the reality is a million different th possibilities could happen. So it's like, why? I don't know why we have this propensity to say this is the future or that's the future. But I'm a big fan of the idea of there's a future that looks kind of like this. There's a future that looks kind of like this. There's a future that looks kind of like this. And then I think the key point where, where Peter Schwartz was coming from is plan for all of them. Plan for any of them and, and, and look at these different ways the world might take shape and have your plan be something that works back to, back to um, Judith's agency, right? Like agency is about being prepared for all possibilities. I think it's consistent with the open global mind 
philosophy is any of these could happen. So what, how am I going to go into the future um, anticipating these? And and what's my plan that works the best in, in all of these different scenarios rather than being, you know, wedded to or dependent on a particular future, right? Anyway, I, I, I just really, really love that book and I love that, that cognitive structure, whatever you call it, framework. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, John. And and there's somebody in this Zoom who's done more of that kind of work than probably all of us put together. And that's John Kelly, um, sitting in a cafe in in, in uh, San Francisco someplace. Um, and uh, John, I'll, I'll bring you into the conversation in just a sec. I want to go to Ken, then Doug, then then pass to you so you can okay. think about what, what you want to jump in with. But uh, Ken, go ahead. Good morning. Uh, I think it's no morning for Stacy, and I think everybody else is on the east coast, on the west coast. Oh no, actually, we have a couple east coast people. But um, if you saw the plex today, uh, Dave Witzel was good enough to include the video of the um, interview we did last week with um, uh, Liz Carlisle, and in her book, which is quite wonderful, I highly recommend it. Um, she talks about regenerative capacity of the land and regenerative farming and that um, at, right towards the end of the book, she asks a, an indigenous person, what is it really all about? And she says, it's ancestor work. It's ancestor work that to regenerate the planet requires that we reconnect with our ancestors, both those who came before and those who will come after. This is my interpretation. That's not what this woman says. But to me, ancestor work always includes those who came before and those who will come after. And I think that's one of the big missing pieces in the puzzle is people are isolated. They don't have a sense of belonging uh, to a stream of humanity that's been going on for, you know, hundreds of thousands of years or possibly millions, if you, depending upon how far back you want to cite the emergence of, of humanity. Um, and we don't have a sense of how it's going to, how, how it goes forward into the future. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that most people are disconnected from the land. Um, when you are not connected to the land, you fall out of the, the rhythms and cycles of nature. And I think that has an enormous impact on most of the, uh, postmodern contemporary thinking, especially that of organizations where you have people who are a hundred stories up, totally not connected to the land, making decisions that are impacting people tens of thousands of miles away with zero, uh, result, zero awareness of the consequences of those decisions, but they make sense on paper. They make sense in the fast world of, of economics, of, of business, of making money. They don't make sense in the slow world of building up soil capacity and regenerative capacity. So uh, that's a little bit meta, but that's where my mind goes. It's uh, never met a meta I didn't like, and that's a really good one, Ken. Thank you. Um, Doug, then John. Uh, John. Uh... I, I did a lot of work with Global Business Network and Peter Schwartz. And one of the things that's clear is that Peter had one main interest, and that was making a lot of money. He also had the fantasy of if he had that money, he could live forever. Uh, the idea that there was something wrong with capitalism was not allowed in the discussions within GBN. Uh, and I think that it just died because it was no longer dynamically relevant to the real issues. Interesting. I participated in a few GBN things and I've been sort of in GBN circles for a long time. I don't remember there feeling like there was a taboo against criticizing capitalism, but that makes sense to me. Um, and yeah, yeah. The, the, yeah. Enough said. Uh, John Kelly. Yes, I would have to agree with Doug that uh, inherent in GBN and inherent in Peter's outlook was of course, some some version of capitalism is is with us. It's going to be the thing that that gets us wherever we're going to go. Um, and so let me just rewind a little bit. Um, there was this idea that, uh, which I agree with completely. It, I think John brought it up that the reason for getting scenarios is not to pick the best one. It's not to predict the future. It's to force yourself to experience a richer range of alternatives than you're going to be comfortable with uh, on your own. And on your own is important. I, I don't know. I mean, I could sit down and I could write four scenarios for the future of any number of things because uh, I did it a lot, but I would 
I would, a little warning light would go off in my head and it would say, hey, you know, you're doing the thing that you, you know, you're, you're very strong uh, prohibitions uh, against doing that because there's the understanding that it has to be the product of uh, discussion. It has to be the product of multiple minds. So in a way, scenarios themselves are a device for forcing the appreciation of multiple perspectives. There's also what you do with the old, with the scenarios. So that, you know, that, that idea that we slipped into alternatives thinking. One of the ways we tried to break this uh, when we ran scenario workshops was we wouldn't let people say which one was best until the very end. And before we got there, we said, well, which one is, let's rank them in terms of high risk, low risk. Let's rank them in terms of how much they match your current resources or they stretch your current resources. Let's rank, rank them in terms of how much they offer advantages to somebody else who might be your competitor, might be your collaborator. You know, and it, it, again, we kept changing the lens and that would force people out of their their preferences um, for which one they wanted to do. And then finally we would get around to the, to the end and we would say, okay, now which, and, and, and our version of was not best. It was, which one are you willing to commit your agency to? Which one are you willing to say, this is the one I'm going to put, you know, I'm going to invest in, invest my energy and my credibility. And then which one is the one that's most frightens you that you want to put a scout on uh, you hope it doesn't happen, but you want to put a scout on it to uh, to watch for it. So that's just some stuff about scenarios. Th there's a uh, there's someone named Jim Bendel. Uh, some of you 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 know we've been, you know we've mentioned him here on the calls before. He's the deep adaptation guy. Yeah. Okay. So I just it it's very interesting in terms of taking the scenario issue and the capitalism issue and a couple of other issues and and in a way flipping them on their head. I mean, he's gonna do, he's coming to the Bay Area in October. He's gonna run four days of pretty dark sounding scenarios. And, uh, you know, what are, the, what are the global metrics that suggest to him that we're not gonna make it, that we've already passed tipping points. And I've applied to be in this thing. Uh, there's, it's limited how many people they're gonna let do it. But it's kind of like, I don't, like that perspective at all you know but i i'm very interested to see how he transitions from uh really bleak kind of outlooks really kind of bleak versions of the future and gets around to what is a positive agency and i a lot of it is that the things that people have already brought up the ancestor view the idea that you know what's your connection to the past what's your connection to the future what could we do that would equip however many people we survive, equip them to better reconstruct a civilization if this one collapses. So that's just another thing, another piece of the puzzle that's going on. I love the, I love the dark corners we're visiting. It's great. Yeah. Right. Uh, you're, you're reminding me of some good sci-fi I read a while ago. There was Seven Eves and also... Uh, Oh, what was the other one? I'm forgetting. I read them both close to each other, and they were both like Earth is Earth is destroyed kind of scenarios. Yeah. Uh, the other one was Kim Stanley Robinson. Um, yeah. And uh, and you know who gets off the Earth to survive? Who stays on the Earth in tunnels and and manages to survive and surprises everybody who returns by by still being alive? Kind of thing. That those sorts yeah. of plot twists, yeah. right? Right. Um, Those are great. It's really interesting. You also reminded me that I I worked for a while uh, at John Keo's Idea Factory. Uh, mm -hmm. which was in the organic building, uh, you know, south of market. And it was fascinating. And and so the Idea Factory's best gig, the thing they were designed to do was to pay, take a client that had just finished doing scenario planning work with GBN and had their novellas in a, in a spiral bound notebook. They would take those novellas and enact them. They hired uh, a, a, several improv actors known as the, 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 Fratelli Bologna or something like that. Um, <laughs> and they would they would then create mock-ups. They would create a Time magazine cover from the year 2020 or whatever, some, you know, some, some far distant future back then. Uh, and they would try to enforce, you know, divide up their space. They had a, they had a, uh, Erica Gregory was their producer and she was out of theater and magical, really, really good at, at doing all of that and writing scripts and all that. 
And they would, they would, and I figuratively, I thought of it as they would take the client another mile down the road and then drop them off. And mm -hmm. it really impressed me how long it takes to absorb some new way of being in the world. Yes. Uh, it, it, it really like, like we would have had a hard time imagining the ubiquitous intertubes, uh, you know, 40 years ago. It's a few people had the vision and they were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're just going to have ubiquitous communications. Look, it's going to be great. But even they would have been hard pressed <clears throat> to say that in their lifetimes, they were holding a slab of unobtainium that allowed them to communicate at nearly zero marginal cost with anybody around the world in full motion video. Like, really? Um, and, that, and that that would lead to TikTok. And that that would lead to TikTok and the TikTok would be a, a bigger phenomenon, you know, would grow as big as YouTube, et cetera, et cetera. Those things are not easily seen. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and so one of the things I suggested to Idea Factory that they didn't do was offer every client to start four mailing lists, uh, one for each scenario. And anybody mm -hmm. from the client company can hop across the mailing list and we will staff the mailing list with people who would enforce those scenarios so that they could just yeah. dip into it and experience the conversation over time in the, in this altered reality. I'm not even sure a mailing list with a facilitator would work, but at least it would continue the thinking deeper because you finish an interesting workshop that changed your mind. You go back to your daily pressures, you are sucked under immediately and you're not going to be able to influence a whole lot of people with a, with a lot of change. The alternative is you hire McKinsey or Deloitte or somebody to come in and do a change program for $10 million and many of those don't work either. So how do you cause this change of perspective in people? If I can say just one thing we tried and we it was a hard sell. We could not, we did, we did get a division of a company, large company, and I'll tell you what happened to them. But the, the, the plan was, okay, you develop these scenarios. We have these events with dates on them. We have these threads linking the scenarios. That's the workshop, you know, that's the kind of standard paper and so on workshop thing don't let's not just take pictures of those let's actually physically save these boards let's roll them into a closet and every month you roll the four of them out and you say okay any events happening on this scenario any events happening on this scenario so hmm. on so on it was a tough sell we we the only place we got that bought that approach was the software development uh division of digital and when they tried to go upstairs with their insights from that, they hit the, the wall. You know, they said, in fact, at one point, um, digital forbade the use of the word strategy Ooh. for some divisions. <laughs> that, and so that entire group, you know, just sent their resumes out. You know, they, some of them came to us and they said, can we, can we just come and work for you? I mean, we can see what's going to happen here. We're going yeah. over a cliff. Yeah. And we said, no, unfortunately, you can't work for us right away. Go work somewhere else and then you can come back. Yeah. But uh, yeah, they just they just all scattered because they could see digital wasn't going to wasn't going to act on the, the wisdom that they had developed. Just yesterday, I found uh, I found something I've been looking for. It's a printed out email that I sent uh, Fisher, George Fisher, who was then president of Kodak. And I had just had a briefing from two Kodak minions when they were mm -hmm. they were nice and smart, but I could tell that like they were doomed. Um, so I wrote an email to the to the president saying, hey, whatever. And um, three weeks later, something like that, in the mail, I get a printout of my email with his handwritten response. Wow. And I'm like, <laughs> well, this is one reason why. <laughs> yeah. Right here. I've got evidence yeah. right here. Here's, right. Well, here's well, a, here's an a, artifact. Yeah. Here's a receipt of the demise of Kodak. There we go. Right. Dave. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want, so I mean, one of the things that like it's fundamental to me is the, the so much of the conversation, like Joe, you just kind of use the words like we can't get them to decide, you know, and and there's the implication that a lot of our work is to influence them um, and make them do something different, and you know, so I'm kind of internalized, you know, going back to Ken, like what are the fundamentals of like generational thinking, you know, I've kind of internalized that really whatever change has to happen has to start with me, right? So the first thing you should do is like work on your practice, I guess. Um, and and yet it's like, it doesn't seem like if I just go become a monk and live in a cave for seven years, that's the right answer exactly either. So I have to do something else that influences other people. So you're, I'm stuck with it. You know, to me, the question has got to be, what should I do now? You know, um, and, and 
And then, you know, so then the long term, you know, I guess there's a notion of like, I'm going to work on a long termism framework, or I'm going to work on an effective altruism framework, or I don't know, something like that. But, but I mean, I think we do have to take it back to like me doing now, you know, and, and the whole bunch of this is I have to be able to think better, I have to be able to communicate better, you know, I, I think a ton of it is self help. But. Um, yeah, uh, it's, um, it's funny, because also, consultants often have more outsized influence in companies because often after an interesting consulting session, people will walk up to you and say, I've been trying to tell them that for years. And then your answer to them is, yes, the problem is you're an employee and you're in a subservient position to them. And they're not paying you enough money to listen to you or something like that. Uh, and, and it's weird because um, the advice is out there. It's just that everybody's blind to it or, or not able to see it. Well, I, and I look back on the consulting that we did, you know, 20 or 30 years ago, and I'm not sure that a lot of it was all that good. You know, it was like my advice was that smart. So I, they might have listened to it more, but maybe they shouldn't have, you know. And so I guess I feel like, you know, this, this is back to the kind of the premises a little bit. And and for one of the things that's different is, is to me, I, I do buy into some of the Carol Sanford thinking that if I reframe my role as is, is not, you know, like if I'm not looking for my passion or I'm not looking for becoming, making myself rich, what am I doing? I'm, I'm an ancestor, I'm serving the system. So then I have to sense what the system needs and try to respond to the needs of the system. So that to me gives me a very different framing that I think I had as a consultant, um, but, but it's still pretty, pretty iffy as to how well I understand that. Love that. Thank you. Jose? Yeah, I, I love that too, Dave. It's, um, it's very consistent with what I was thinking, which is, it seems to me that we're trying to, this conversation is leading to sort of like, how do we control something? Um, uh, if not them, the other, or the organization, like you talk about, that's why Clodet failed. Kodak have a lifespan, and Kodak. Yeah, but Nokia was Nokia was once a uh, paper manufacturer. Then it made rubber boots. Then it made cell phones. Then it died and is trying to become something else. Same same company. But what does it matter? Itself. But what does it matter? What uh, does it matter if it's if it's an an organization that has a lifespan that starts and ends, or an organization that reinvents itself all all the time? Um, we have this attachment to this thing that says, well, they could have survived. They could have been a forever company. Could have been a contender. What What does that mean? What What is it that we want from that? We get attached to a brand or to a concept or to a model, and then we, we choose to have that thing stay around, even though it may no longer serve at all, right? Um, but, what I've been thinking throughout this whole conversation is I'm not sure why what you're asking um, matters. Huh. Like what, what, what is it? What's the aim of, of this direction of thought? Like what, what it, what do we do with it? So my originating thought was, we need to do we need to worry about the long term. We need to do things that are consistent with thriving in the longer term. And there's a movement called long termism that seems to have been taken down, blah, blah, blah. There's like politics or forces that are causing people to to not, and we've also seen a lot of kind of uh, anecdotal evidence uh, on this call about, there are no more futures groups. The futurists all seem to be broken. What's going on? Like like we're not looking out ahead enough. And I, I don't particularly care what constellation, and I think that it's not going to be the present set of organizational structures that we take for granted, as you, you were just saying, Josie. Um, I, I, I don't particularly care what the organizational structures are. I would like humans to have a better, better time of it in 100 or 200 or 300 years um, and not be in the mortal danger that Doug Carmichael is always pointing our, our noses toward. Um, so that, you know, we actually think there'll be humans around or enough of them thriving. So, so that, that's the why for me is like, hey, if, if we don't 
act better in, in some kind of rough concert. And you, you raise a really interesting point about controlling other people or or the them question that, that Dave raised. I'm 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 really interested in helping shape how we think about the future and participating in it with other people in some way that condenses toward attractor points emerge in an emergent fashion as opposed to any kind of dick agreeing on some central thesis and then driving a policy along that thesis that, that I don't think that works I don't think that that's uh, you know a, a, a thing that's going to happen but I'm really interested in, a, in in attracting or being part of a large body of people who go do stuff in a particular way because they agree with the a rhythm of the regenerative economy or whatever it is, or donut economics or whatever it is. And I collect, I've got a thought in my brain called communities trying to fix world problems. And it's got multiple dozen, and there probably should be hundreds, but I've, I've got multiple dozen orgs out there uh, that are trying to come up with a plan B is one of them, right? There's a whole thing out there, a uh, game B. Uh, there's a whole community of people out there, Jim Rudd and others who are, who are busy trying to figure out how do we fix stuff? And they have assumptions, they have models, they have a practice, they, they, they're trying to do this. Jem Bendel, is, he's not sort of necessarily trying to fix world problems. He's trying to like make it so that humans can survive the world problems we're about to face, which may be the same thing. Um, so, so that's the why for me. Does that ring for you? Yeah, very much. And, and I think framed in that way, it resonates strongly. Um, but the way that it was framed, at least what I was hearing, it felt very much like... Uh, how are we going to think our way out of this? And we're not going to think our way out of this. No. We're going to act our way out of this. And that means doing things. And the only way we can do things is by rolling up our sleeves and doing it, not framing things endlessly. And it felt like maybe that's what where we were going. So thank you for that. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, Judy. I was just wondering whether it might be useful to have some separate conversations as a topic rather than trying to do the whole span from ideation to demise, <laughs> if we want to break it into some segments. And the one that I'm drawn to is the question of agency. What is it that allows agency to happen? How could we individually and collectively influence agency? Because it's sort of like you only need one agency active person in a group to influence a group to change from inaction to action. And I'm wondering if there's if that would be worthy of some deep diving on how to facilitate both in contemporary society and through children in the future of the world, a sense of personal agency, that they do have the ability to influence what they experience and do and what others experience and do. Because that's, without some action component, it's hopeless. <laughs> and and the, the agency on large spheres, I mean, we've watched interminably the uh, mediocre response to governmental agency in terms of attempting to put policies or incentives in place that would cause people to change behaviors and they largely don't work. So, I mean, I, somehow we need to find a different corner of the dilemma to work on. So maybe thinking about as a group where our individual agency is collectively or personally and, and going from we're here now, what's the, what are the next alternative steps rather than focusing on such a big goal that it's difficult to see the, a concrete path to get there right now. Um, just a thought. Um, Judy, your simple thought resonates strongly with me. That is, a, 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 how do we regain our sense of agency is really, really central to me. I'm wondering if it resonates with other people on the call. Uh, if it does, we'll make that the topic in two weeks. Uh, raise your hands. We've got a queue. I saw Scott and John. Uh, go ahead and raise your Zoom hands. And uh, I will go to Ken next. Thanks, Jose, for pointing out that we're not going to think our way out of this. I think this... Um opens the door for uh, an ancient mode of um, bringing in new information and getting different perspectives on things, which is shamanism. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with shamanism, uh, Michael Harner wrote a book called The Way of the Shaman, discovered that um, there's a very specific um, rhythm that allows people to enter into an altered state of consciousness. And 
uh, he went around to uh, all these different tribes and studied shamanism. And then he actually went around to tribes who'd lost their their um, uh, their shamans due to in um, European influence, and taught them how to regain it. And then they went off and they reconstructed all this this knowledge that had been uh, uh, brought forth before. But it's not accepted by most people in the scientific community. Uh, so we, they need a pluralistic approach here. This is not all going to come out of people who are going to study things. There's also the need to uh, to tap into these other ways of being, these other modes of consciousness that are right there. As William James said, you know, divided by the thinnest of veils, there's all these other worlds. They have tremendous influence. And it's not something that I see integrated or appreciated in most contemporary people. Um, so I think it's it's going to be, uh, it, it's not the solution, but it is a contributing element to whatever solution we cook up. The following comment is not meant at all to minimize what Ken just said, but rather to draw attract, attract attention to it and maybe make it memorable. So in two weeks, our next call about a sense of agency will be held under the influence of psilocybin. I want to point out, I did a workshop with Michael <laughs> And he said, okay, we're, you know, I want everybody to move all your books and stuff out of the way because in this workshop, we do journey, but we do not trip. <laughs> you love bad puns. I know a couple of people who love bad puns. Um, where is Neil anyway? We haven't seen him for a while and you can. Um, Stacy, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just wanted to say that, well, I'm going to be the Pollyanna of the group because I see something very different when it comes to agency in the younger generation. And I, I kind of have felt this since the Parkland shooting. And I guess I'll find out if I was right after the election. But if I am right, at least the popular vote is going to be a landslide because ever since Parkland, I have really believed that the younger generation was feeling empowered and they were gonna do things. And what I thought was different about this particular group of people is that they had affluent parents that were going to help support them. So like when I hear Judy saying, you know, what can we be doing? I see older people needing to take more of a support role and to be there to support what the younger people want to do with their new ideas, they see things differently. Things are different for them. And the internet has made things very different. Um, I unfortunately grew up in very different circumstances than Judy. I was taught that I had no power, that I could not change everything. Even though my parents voted, I was taught your vote didn't matter. Um, but young people, and I do have the mind of a young person, don't believe that they know that they can make a difference. And when I watch what's happening at the DNC, I see people that feel empowered and speaking to the that magic that Ken was alluding to, I feel the joy and joy is empowering. And just one little snippet, you know, I heard it rumored that, um, you know, we're always taught to put things in the positive. We will do something. And I heard there was a little pushback that the the chanting was, we won't go back, we won't go back. And that Kamala said, no, we're going to do whatever the audience is resonating with. And the thing is, the old logic doesn't wash anymore because things have tipped a little bit. And there's an anger coming up and we won't go back. And so what may have worked 10 years ago, 20 years ago, that's not the same as what there is now. And I just want to share one more thing because it's just been on my mind. This is a piece of paper from about 15 years ago. And I wrote down a quote. I was watching PBS and I was listening. Deepak Chopra had written a book with this neuroscientist about the brain and consciousness. And he wrote, there's a spontaneous evolution of self-organizing dynamic, dynamic networks of karmically connected souls, people who have the same soul values are organizing themselves by themselves. For me, this has always meant the internet and it's how I find, find my way in this room right now. Because 
Who'd have thunk that I'd be sitting here with these people right here? Like something led me here. So I just I just wanted to share that there's groups like this all over doing doing more. Like we may be talking and thinking that's the expertise in this room. But in communities, there are groups that are making changes in their community and then they're connecting with other communities. And I just want to say don't give up hope. <laughs> Thank you, Stacey. I think you've started the conversation into for that we're going to have in two weeks, uh, right there. Um, Scott, please. Oh, um, I'll start with the least contentious. So, uh, sense of agency. My experience has been start as local as possible. Your your volume is pretty low. I don't know oh, why. That's interesting. Yeah, I don't think you're on whatever microphone you think you're on. We can hear you. It's just that your your audio is much lower than everybody else's has been so far. Yeah, somebody has told me that. So let me see if I can make a quick adjustment. Well, actually, I'll just talk louder to keep going. Is that better? Project. Yeah. All right. I'll just talk louder for a second. Um, sense of agency, start local, as local as possible to get some uh, a quick win and traction. I've found that that's, it can be hopeless when you're trying to change something huge. And I think this this idea of, it doesn't matter what you change, but change something near you. And then you will see that you can change, which is really the whole momentum of agency. When you realize that you can, I've had lots of experiences uh, in my hockey coaching world where telling someone or, or giving them that, vision that they could do something. No one had told them that before. And no one had had given them that vision. And so the sense of agency, I think, to uh, Stacy's point, wasn't there. They, they didn't have the internal permission because they didn't realize they could. So that, to me, is is a way of getting that agency that, um, that Judith was talking about, I think, is to start as small as you possibly can. So there's a the contentious part is about the thinking our way out of it. Um, I have a different perspective on that. I don't think there's any other way to, to get out of it because I think we think about thinking as not doing. Well, I'm thinking, so therefore I'm not doing anything. And, you know, to Jose's point about, or Jose's point about the, um, we need to be acting. I was like, well, yeah, and and, the first step of any action is making a distinction about what you're going to act about in relation to other things from a certain perspective. You have to think in order to act. And so it's, you know, okay, go, go ahead and act. Um, it's kind of like, you want to play a game? Anybody want to play a game? Okay, you go first. And And what do you do? Like you don't, you can't do anything until you know the game that you're playing. And that's a that's a thing where, where this group tends to go into, well, maybe if we don't think our way out of it, maybe we can feel our way out of it. Maybe we can sense our way out of it. And it's like, I, I don't see that as any different from thinking you have to make a, a, a thought, try it out, go into the action, and then think again and act and think and act. I don't see those as if I'm thinking I'm not doing anything. So th again, that that's my that's my thought. That's coming from a lot of that systems thinking work that I've been doing. So um, anyway. Thanks, Scott. Quiet. Yeah, thank you. We're nearing the end of our call time. I have loved this call. Thank you all for jumping in so wonderfully. Uh, anyone want to summarize or set some challenges for our next conversation? I think I think we're agreed here that uh, the sense of agency that Judy put in the room is a nice topic for two weeks from now. Next week, we'll do check-in week after. We'll do that. Um, any other thoughts? I just wanted to uh, follow up on that. Sorry, on the on the 60% thing in the chat there, Jerry, and the landslide, yeah. Stacey's landslide. And my, my point simply being that this is like, that was the biggest vote differential that the United States has had in I don't know, maybe ever. Yep. And it was, it was, you know, 60%. Right. And, you know, we, what was the last election was 40,000 votes out of a couple hundred million. So, so 
it, it turns out that the the change, these dramatic changes, swing around very small differences. Um, and I, I just find it fascinating to think that you know, uh, you know, like the, this this line that a couple of votes in every precinct might matter. Uh, you know, it's like it's kind of true, and it's a little scary. It is a little frightening. Um, let me go to John Kelly because he's driving first, and then to you, John. Thank, thank you. Uh, yeah, I would just add the thought. I like I have a great conversation. I like the way we're going. I like the plan for the future. I would just add the thought that um, both long what we frame long term thinking. We we leaned into scenarios. What were we doing with scenarios? Well, we were trying to expand the range of things under consideration. The same rule can be applied to long and short-term thinking. You know, it, initially we went to long-term, I mean, some of the people went to long-term because they thought we were obsessed with short-term and they needed to weaken short-term. Other people think, no, no, we're not, we don't actually realize that we're very close to these tipping points. We're not being short-term enough. Neither, neither perspective is, is, uh, is permanent. You obviously have to consider both long-term and short-term, and you have to consider multiple versions of the long-term and the short-term all the time. But fortunately, we're capable of doing that. <laughs> you know, we have great uh, possibilities for creative narrative, and that's how we should, we should use those capabilities. Right. Okay. Score points for Apes with Language. Love it. Yeah. Um, John Warner. Yeah, mine is just a question. You mentioned uh, focusing on agency in two weeks. Is there something happening next week? They're not happening. That we alternate we... formats uh, on the OGM okay. weekly call. So every other week is a check-in call where we just go around the room and everybody checks in on whatever they're doing. This OGME. We also have a lot of silence, a lot more pauses in the the check-in call. So it's it's just a matter of our our rhythm. Thank you. Cool. Um, Mr. Homer, have, have thou, hast thou a poem for us? Of course. So I found this poem this week on my computer. I have a tendency to take screenshots of things. So I found that taking a screenshot of this poem and don't know where it came from, but I thought, you know, I like this poem. And then as I'm listening into it, I thought this actually would, would kind of work because it, it does, it is related. So it's called what you missed the day you were absent from fourth grade. As by Brad Aaron Modlin. <clears throat> Mrs. Nelson explained how to stand still and listen to the wind, to find meaning in pumping gas, how peeling potatoes can be a form of prayer. She took questions on how to not feel lost in the dark. After lunch, she distributed worksheets that covered ways to remember your grandfather's voice. Then, classed the class discussed falling asleep without feeling that you had forgotten to do something else, something important, and how to believe the house you wake up in is your home. This prompted Mrs. Nelson to draw a chalkboard diagram detailing how to chant the Psalms during cigarette breaks and how not to squirm for the sound when your own thoughts are all that you hear. Also, that you have enough. The English lesson was that I am is a complete sentence. And just before the afternoon bell, she made the math equation look easy. The one that proves hundreds of questions and feeling cold and all those nights spent looking for whatever it was you lost and one person add up to something. That was beautiful. Would you mind reading it again? Sure. What you miss the day you were absent from fourth grade. Mrs. Nelson explained how to stand still and listen to the wind, to find meaning in pumping gas, how peeling potatoes can be a form of prayer. She took questions on how not to feel lost in the dark. After lunch, she distributed worksheets that covered ways to remember your grandfather's voice. Then the class discussed falling asleep without feeling you had forgotten to do something else, something important, and how to believe the house you wake in is your home. This prompted Mrs. Nelson to draw a chalkboard diagram detailing how to chant the Psalms during cigarette breaks and how not to squirm for sound when your own thoughts are all that you hear. Also, that you have enough. 
the English lesson was that I am is a complete sentence. And just before the afternoon bell, she made the math equation look easy. The one that proves that hundreds of questions and feeling cold and all those nights spent looking for whatever it was you lost and one person add up to something. That brings tears to my eyes. <laughs> yeah, I just, I don't know. I found that I took the screenshot of this a while ago and I looked at it. What is I had to type this out. This is a fantastic poem. I found a, I found it online. I put a link in the chat. Um, it's beautiful. I, what do you, what's the, this genre of poetry called? Because Billy Collins hits this note a lot and a few other people manage it. Mary Oliver gets here. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, it's sort of this conversational wisdom that's not framed in strong rhyme or meter or anything. It's, it, but, but it's poetic in its, in its just approach to everything. Yeah. I, I don't know what to call it. I just call it art. <laughs> just, you know, yeah. I call it good poetry. It's beautiful. Um, uh, yeah, I, I really love this poem. I, I especially like, you know, how not how to remember your grandfather's voice. What a good, oh, you know. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Thank you for bringing that gift for us. Something. And now Is there I'm an here. irony that none of that would have been discussed in a fourth grade class? <laughs> <laughs> right, that's part of the irony. Scott, what did you miss here? So I misheard the very last line. I thought it was, can one person add up to something? Which to me said the experience of having that teacher, all of those little actions added up to a, a wonderful whole experience. And that's, it kind of reframed the whole thing for me. And, and I think it might've been a misinterpretation. I don't know. <laughs> Well, that's the beauty of poetry. You know, you hear what you hear and your brain makes its own connections. Um, and it it's often whatever you need in that moment shows up. And you look at it again, you go, oh, I totally got that wrong, but it was right at the time. Yeah. And this poem was perfect for this moment. Yeah. Thank you. My pleasure. Um, thank you all. We now have a plan for the next two, two weeks. Uh, Thank you so much. And let's be careful out there. Thank you. Yes. Ciao. Ciao.